The, the monetary system that we have now was never chosen by some democratic means. It's something that's evolved over the last, uh, you know, over the last 100 and 150 years. Um, and really what we have now is basically a, an accident. Um, it was not intelligent design. It wasn't uh, anybody sitting down and saying, how do we want the system to work? So I'm going to explain what I think is wrong with this system and how we, how we need to fix it. Um, so let's go back to the beginning. Let's look at what we have today. Who creates money right now? And why should you care? Um, so the question, okay, who makes these? Coins and the notes. The National Bank. The, the National Bank. Okay, so the, you know, maybe the Central Bank of Denmark, uh, the Bank of England, the European Central Bank. Um, and it actually says on the side of every coin, on, on every note. Um, what happens if you make your own? It looks something like this. Um, so we all know that if you try and make your own money, you get, you get arrested. You get the police coming to, um, to speak to you. But there's a, a twist in this story. Because this kind of physical money that we use makes up only 3% of the money that exists. So what about the other 97%? What is that? Um, so 97% of money is just bank deposits. So those numbers that you see in your bank account when you check your balance, they don't represent any physical money in the safe at the bank. It's actually just an accounting entry um, in their computer system. And these bank deposits are actually created by uh, the, the big banks. Um, the banks that we, we know every day, and some of the banks that were implicated in the financial crisis. And banks can create new money in the form of those numbers in your account, every time somebody takes out a loan. Um, so every time they make a loan, they create brand new money. Now, usually when I tell people this, they think I'm crazy. Um, so I'm going to show you, this is a, an article from the Bank of England that came out in March this year. And in it, they say, uh, commercial uh, that's high street banks create money in the form of bank deposits by making new loans. When a bank makes a loan, for example, to someone taking out a mortgage to buy a house, it does not typically do so by giving them thousands of pounds worth of banknotes. Instead, it credits their bank account with a bank deposit the size of the mortgage. At that moment, new money is created. So the vast majority of the money in our economy is created when people go into debt. And this is a fundamental point uh, for how the financial system works. Uh, this is the chief uh, economics correspondent for the Financial Times in London. Um, the way he describes it, he says, the essence of the contemporary monetary system is the creation of money out of nothing by private banks, often foolish lending. So if this is the first time you've heard this and you weren't aware, um, it's not your fault. Most people have no idea of this. Um, a lot of the economics textbooks don't fully explain this um, in, in the books that are being used in universities. We actually, in the UK, we did a, um, a survey uh, through a professional company of members of parliament to find out how many of them understood the way the system works. And seven out of ten still believe that only the government can create money, including the numbers in your bank account, um, when actually 97% of money is now created by, by private companies. Um, only one in ten members of parliament actually understood this. I, I imagine if you do this in the Danish parliament, you'll find the same, the same results. Um, the textbooks, this is the, um, the, this is Adair Turner. He was the head of the UK bank regulator, the Financial Services Authority. Um, and he said this uh, in a speech recently. If you pick up most undergraduate textbooks and you see how they describe the role of, bank, of the banking system, they make two mistakes. First of all, they describe a system which takes money from savers and then lends it to borrowers, failing to realize that the banking system creates credit, money, and purchasing power. Secondly, they say, well, what banks do is they take deposits from households and lend money to businesses. As a description of what the modern advanced economy banking systems do, this is completely methodological. Um, and the Bank of England said, um, the reality of how money is created today differs from the description found in some economic textbooks. I think they actually meant most uh, textbooks. Rather than banks receiving deposits when households save and then lending them out, bank lending actually creates deposits. Um, in normal times, the central bank does not fix the amount of money in circulation, nor is central bank money multiplied up into more loans and deposits. Um, 
So really, the, the, the common understanding of how banks work is, is inaccurate. Uh, most politicians don't understand it. Most members of the public don't understand it. And many of the economists and policymakers that were responding to the financial crisis don't fully understand these, um, these fundamentals of the monetary system. So, um, so the design flaws of the, um, the current system, I'll go through them. The first one is the incentives that it gives to the people that create money. So the people that create money right now are the people that work in banks and effectively the people that tell, tell those people what to do. So the directors of these big banks. Now if you're a lending officer in a bank, your incentives to get you to lend and to create money is this. You get you know, commission, bonuses, you meet your sales targets for how much you have to lend. Um, you get promoted if you're very successful. If you don't lend, you miss your targets, you get demoted, and eventually you get fired because nobody wants a, a bank that won't lend. Um, if you're one of the bank uh, directors, by increasing your lending and creating more money, you boost your profits, you boost your market capitalization, you boost your market share compared to other banks, um, and you also get your status and prestige of being a director of one of the largest banks in the country. Um, if you don't, you lose your market share. Uh, you know, shareholders might try to unseat you because you're not growing the bank quickly enough, um, or you get fired. And so these incentives are facing the people that currently decide whether or not to create money. And that means that they're pretty much always driven to create money, if possible, um, when the economy is doing well. Um, so they, they have an incentive to create too much, really. And this is the result in the UK. Um, so we started in 1970 with 29 billion pounds in the economy. That tripled over the next 10 years uh, to 107 billion. That increased uh, five times to 495 billion by 1990. Um, not quite so quick up to 2000. But then as a result of all the lending that went on before the crisis, this is how much money was created, running up to the peak. And then this, uh, where you see the very top here, that's the point where the financial crisis hit. So then the next design flaw is the, the criteria on which um, the people in banks decide whether or not to create money. It's, um, it's essentially comes down to this. Can the borrower repay the loan um, and the interest from the income that they have? And do they have some collateral that we can repossess in case they don't? Um, but the problem is that um, the, the answers to these questions really depend on whether you're in an economic boom or in a recession. So when things are doing really well, when banks are lending, um, the economy does well. And um, the answer to both of these questions is usually yes, which means they, they lend more and more. Um, when it's a recession, the answer is usually no, because the, the collateral might not be, um, you know, you, if you repossess the house, you may not be able to sell it for enough to cover the loan that you made. Um, so this guarantees that they're going to create too much in the boom times and too little in, uh, in recessions. And because they, they're very focused on collateral, which you can repossess, which makes the loan safer from the perspective of the bank, this is where most of the money goes. 51% uh, into the property market. Uh, sorry, these are figures are for the UK in the 10 years running up to the financial crisis. 31% went into the financial markets. Um, just 8% went into businesses outside the financial sector. And just eight, uh, sorry, the remaining 8% went into um, credit cards and personal loans. And those figures don't quite add up, so there's uh, you know, the other criteria for the other 2%. It, but also it's a very cyclical system, particularly like one really good example of this is in housing. So the way this works is um, you, know, you have reasonable house prices, and banks say, well, we think there's space for house prices to go up. We think people can afford to pay more. Um, so we think they're going to go up, we're going to lend more into the housing market. But because they're creating new money, the lending that they do actually pushes the price up. So they start lending more, house prices go up, and then they say, oh, look, we, we were right. Um, we guessed what was going to happen in the future. Um, because house prices are going up, we should actually lend more into this market. It's a, you know, an opportunity to, to expand our lending. Prices go up even further. And so, well, look, they're still rising, we should keep lending more for mortgages. They start lending 100% you know, mortgages and then eventually 125% uh, mortgages. And, um, and then finally they start to say, well, look, it, it doesn't really matter if the borrower can repay the loan or not. Because with house prices rising as quickly as they are, 
even if the borrower defaults, we can sell a house for more than we actually lent them in the first place. Um, so then they stop worrying so much about whether you can actually pay that loan. And um, this is kind of the story of what happened in the financial crisis. There's other elements to it as well. But um, So when, when you allow banks to create money, and most of that money goes into the property market, you end up with this highly unaffordable housing and this, um, this boom-bust economic system. And the effect of that now is if you're a first-time buyer um, in London or in the UK, which I might be at some distant point in the future, um, you have to give, currently, you have to give up 53% of your take-home salary to pay the mortgage. And that's at a time when interest rates are at a historical low. So as soon as they go up, there's real problems here in, um, in the affordability of housing there. Okay, so one of the other problems is that it makes the entire economy dependent on debt. And we all sort of get brought up with this idea that you know, it's good to have money, money is good, debt is a bad thing. But the thing is, if, um, if money is only created when people go into debt, then you can't have one without the other. You know, the two are effectively the same in the current system. Um, so we, we had our Prime Minister in the UK saying, look, everybody needs to pay off their credit cards for the sake of the nation. Um, what he didn't realise is what will happen if everybody does that. So think about this. If um, money is created when people go into debt, what happens when people repay those loans? Yeah, the, the money actually disappears. So it's exactly the reverse accounting process. So when everybody starts repaying their debt, the amount of money in the economy shrinks. Um, again, uh, a lot of people find this hard to believe. This is uh, the way the Bank of England described it. They said, just as taking out a new loan creates money, the repayment of bank loans destroys money. Banks making loans and consumers repaying them are the most significant ways in which bank deposits are created and destroyed in the modern economy. Um, so it's not really the case that you know, money is good and debt is banned. In the current system, they are the same thing. Um, and what it means for the economy as a whole is that if we want to get more money in the, into the economy, for example, if we've just had a recession and we need to boost employment, so we want people to spend more, to get more money into the economy, you have to get people to go further into debt because banks will only create money when people are going into debt. Um, if you want less debt in the economy and people repay those debts, then you end up with less money. And that's not good for the economy because there's less money, there's less spending, um, and you have a recession. Um, so the government has a choice between these two policy options, really. And what the UK government, and actually most governments around the world have done, is they've said, we'll go for this option. We'll get people to lend, so we'll get people to borrow more. We'll create another housing bubble um, because they'll get more money into the system um, and then that will get the economy growing again. But the problem is that the higher the level of debt goes, um, so I mean, I'll show you this. This is a, um, an academic study by two professors called um, Alan Taylor um, and Moritz uh, Schullerich. And they, they looked at a so there were 14 developing countries, developed countries, sorry, um, which made up about 60% of the world GDP between the years of 1870 to 2008. So like a massive amount of data. And basically what they found was that the only thing that really predicts the financial crisis is a big increase in the level of private debt. Effectively, a, a, a big increase in how much money banks have created through lending. Um, and they said, you know, credit growth is a powerful predictor of financial crisis, suggesting that such crises are credit booms gone wrong and that policymakers ignore credit at their peril. So we have a, um, a system that depends on people going further into debt, but that debt is what will cause the financial crisis. Um, so we, we have a system that's bound to, uh, to collapse. Yeah, so again, the, um, the former bank regulator in the UK, Adair Turner, has said, you know, we got into this mess because of excessive creation of private credit and money we should be concerned if our only escape route implies building up a future excess. Um, also, it makes monetary policy impossible. Um, this is a, a point mainly for the economists here, but um, the central bank has two uh, responsibilities, really. One is to keep price stability, which basically means keeping inflation low. Um, the other one is to have financial stability, which means not letting your banks collapse 
um, as happened in the financial crisis. But to get price stability, they need to keep money coming into the economy um, to keep people spending, which means they really want banks to lend more if they want prices uh, to go up and to keep inflation at target. Uh, the problem is if banks are lending more, then they're becoming more highly leveraged um, and ultimately more unstable. So that has a, a negative impact on financial stability. The guys who are thinking about financial stability, they want the banks to reduce their leverage, which would require them to reduce their lending. But then that's going to have a, a deflationary effect on the economy. Um, and that's potentially going to bring prices down. So these two, because we're so dependent on banks to create the money, that means that these two sort of ob objectives are basically impossible to achieve. You can have one or the other, um, but you can't really achieve both of these. So I think all of this mounts up to say that the, um, with the current system, a, a crisis is inevitable. It is going to happen again. We're making the same mistakes that we made before the crisis, and that is now laying the foundation for the next financial crisis. And some people say, well, you, you can have um, and keep things under control uh, through regulators. So the regulators would you know, need to know what the banks are doing. They need to be able to monitor all the banks, and they need to be able to stop the banks that are doing things either too quickly or in the wrong way. So you need, you need something that's you know, all-knowing, all-seeing, and all-powerful. Um, and the regulators like to think that they have this power. I mean, I think that is more a description of, of God. We need somebody so powerful to oversee these banks and prevent them from blowing up the economy. Um, in, in, the, in the place of God, you have these regulators, and their response to the financial crisis has been to create more rules, uh, to create more uh, legal uh, guidelines that govern how the banks operate. So I spoke to um, a, a senior lawyer at one of the big banks in the UK, and she was saying they're currently dealing with 90 pieces of uh, new regulation. Now, you know, that, that doesn't sound too big for a big bank, but the problem is one of these pieces alone is the Dodd-Frank bill from the US, which is 9,000 pages. So when you, you give so many rules, which are all designed by different national governments, um, there's going to be so many loopholes in those rules and places that they don't work effectively that, you know, in my view, they're just not going to work. Um, this is not going to prevent another crisis. So, how do we fix it? Um, well, we think we need something called a sovereign money system. And there's a few elements to that. We'll, um, I'll go through these now. The first thing is to take the power to create money away from the banks. And the way you do this, I'm not going to go into too much technical detail, but you essentially split banks into two functions. Um, as a customer of the bank, you would go in and you'd have a choice between what we call a transaction account. So this is where you keep your money safe and you know, the money that you actually want to spend. Um, it's like the current or checking accounts we have today. Uh, it's 100% risk free because the money that you put in there will actually be stored at the central bank. Um, so even if your bank fails, that money is still protected. Um, it's instant access, you can get your salary paid in there, you um, would have a debit card, um, there'd be no interest on that account because the money isn't being invested anywhere. Um, so you'd have to pay a small fee for, for actually using this account. Then the alternative is um, investment accounts. And this is where you give your money to the bank and you say, look, I want you to go and invest it in the economy to earn me some interest. Um, okay, so you'd have to say, look, because the money can't be in your account and invested elsewhere at the same time. So you have to give up access to that money for a period of time. Um, but then you get interest on that. And this money wouldn't be guaranteed by the government in the way that currently all accounts are guaranteed by the government, but then the bank is free to do whatever risky stuff they want to. Um, you'd have more control over what the bank does with your money, um, but you wouldn't have the government standing there saying, look, we'll, um, we'll rescue the banks whenever they fail. Um, so you have a choice between you know, absolute safety and taking a little bit of risk when you want to get some return. Um, what this does from a, a banking system perspective is it separates the payment system from the lending business. Um, and the, you know, the banks can still do both of these two things, but they're effectively separated. Um, if the lending business goes wrong, then that side of the business can be liquidated um, and you can repay people from, from selling off the assets. But the actual payment system, which is what the entire real economy operates on, that's completely protected. So banks then would work exactly like most people think they do, 
um, they'd actually take money from savers and lend it to borrowers. And you know, they could still, you wouldn't have to, to get a mortgage, you wouldn't need to find somebody who wants to invest all of the money that you're borrowing for the 25 years it will take to repay. You can still have um, lots of individuals putting in small amounts to fund a big loan, and you can have people putting in uh, small amounts for a smaller period of time, and that actually funding a long-term loan. So some of the benefits that you get from the current banking system would still work in this uh, reform system. Secondly, you need to return this power to a transparent, democratic, and accountable body. So we know from history that we can't rely on the big banks with this power. Um, because they have the incentive to overuse it. Uh, we also can take a pretty good guess that we shouldn't rely on politicians to do it, because whenever there's an election coming up, they'll have the incentive to create too much money to make it seem like the economy is doing well and to, to create a bubble. Um, so the way we think you deal with this problem is you need to make sure that the people who are creating money don't have a conflict of interest. And the way you do that is making a distinction between two decisions. The decision over how much money should we create and what, we should, what should we use that money for. And we're suggesting that you would have a, a committee that makes a decision on how much money to create. So currently you have a committee that sets interest rates. Instead of doing that, they could say, um, you know, instead of relying on the banks to create the money, we do it directly. Um, and once they've created that money, that would then be transferred to the, the government. And the government will be able to decide how to get that money into the economy. So the options available to the government would be to increase government spending, uh, to reduce taxes, um, or also even to just divide the money up equally between everybody and give everybody what is called a citizen's dividend. Um, so then you can go and decide how to spend this, this newly created money. So then the next thing is to create money free of debt. So in the current system, as I showed, the, um, if we want more money, we have to go further into debt. Um, and we've got this choice between having more money and more debt, or less money um, and less debt. Um, what happens when the state creates sovereign money is it can create money without waiting for anybody to borrow it. It can create money and then just spend it into the economy. Um, and that means you can actually have this, this equation. Um, so you can have more money and less debt. Um, and that has really quite profound implications, firstly for the amount of debt that people are in, um, but also for the stability of the financial system. It allows you to pay off a lot of the debts that we've built up in the run, run up to the financial crisis. Then the, the final really important thing is that money, when new money is created, it should go into the real economy. Um, so that's uh, everything outside of the financial sector, really. Um, in the current system, money goes into housing, financial markets, and um, consumer loans. And you don't really want that to happen because that just either inflates house prices, um, it causes financial instability, or it just creates problems with, uh, with personal debt. Um, and we want to make sure that new money actually comes into the real economy, uh, whether that's through people's salaries so that they can spend, or through investment in businesses. Um, so this is uh, it's quite often presented as quite a, you know, a radical idea. The interesting thing is that it's, it's been around since the 1930s. Um, and some of the economists that have presented this, uh, Irvin Fisher, uh, Milton Friedman in 1960, James Tobin in 1987, um, Mervyn King started talking about this in 2010. Mervyn King was the governor of the Bank of England until last year. Um, Adair Turner, again, who was the head of the UK bank regulator, has been talking about this over the last couple of years, um, presenting some of the, the different ideas and some of the benefits of this. Uh, Michael Kumhoff, who is a, uh, uh, he's a deputy chief of the modeling division of the International Monetary Fund, um, has done some study on this and says it would have significant benefits for the economy. Um, and Martin Wolf, who is the main economics commentator for the Financial Times, um, he actually wrote this article, uh, he just called it Strip Banks of Their Power to Create Money. So the proposal would bring huge advantages. It would be possible to increase the money supply without encouraging people to borrow to the hilt. It would end too big to fail in banking. It would also transfer seniorage, uh, the benefits from creating money, to the public. So, so firstly, you'd have a safer banking system. Um, 
you would deal with too big to fail. Part of the reason we have too big to fail is because we, um, we rely on those banks to create the money that we use. And if they fail, then all of the money in our accounts is effectively frozen. Um, if, if, uh, if the big banks in the UK had been allowed to shut down in the crisis, then ten, you know, potentially 10 million people would not have been able to buy food that evening. So these banks have to be rescued because they create the money that we use. Um, by taking that power away from them, you, you deal with that problem. Um, uh, you also have to have bailouts in the current system. And again, when these banks fail, the entire payment system is at risk. Uh, switching to this sovereign money system where banks don't create money allows you to deal with that uh, too big to fail problem. You protect the payment system and you no longer need to bail these banks out when they rescue, sorry, when they fail. Um, because the actual payment system, which the rest of the economy depends on, would still be protected, despite whether these banks make good investment decisions or bad decisions. Um, you get more economic stability. Uh, so instead of having this pro-cyclical money creation in the good times and too little money creation in the bad times, you actually have what is called counter-cyclical uh, money creation. So when you have a recession, the central bank could create more money to get spending going again. And then when things are going very well and you don't need to put any new money into the system, then they create less. Um, so that balances out the, you know, the instability in the economy. Uh, in the current system, so the implications for debt, you need to keep increasing debt to keep the economy growing. Um, but increased debt leads to an increased risk of financial crisis. Um, in a sovereign money system, you don't rely on banks to keep creating more money. You can actually create money through the central bank and have that spent into the economy. So you can get your economy going again without relying on people going further into debt. Um, and then th through this process, that leads to lower debt and also lower risk of financial crisis. It actually makes your financial system safer. Um, in the current system, the profit from creating money, uh, the profit from creating paper money goes to the banks, but the profit on creating electronic money, sorry, I put the wrong way around. The profit on creating paper money goes to the state, and it reduces how much tax we have to pay. Uh, the proceeds from creating electronic money effectively go to the banking system. And it works as a subsidy um, that benefits really the biggest banks uh, more than any, anybody else. Um, there's also the cost of bailouts that falls on government finances. Um, and I'm not sure of the situation in, in Denmark, but in the UK, this, um, this added a lot to the national debt. And that, then that was an excuse for the government to start cutting, uh, cutting essential services that people were relying on. Um, and also the cost of uh, whenever you have a recession, the tax revenue falls, uh, unemployment benefits have to go up, so those costs all, also fall on the government. And these are kind of you know, outcomes of the current system. Um, in a sovereign money system, the same image is regained, it goes back to, um, to the state and to the taxpayer. Um, the, there will be no need for bailouts, you don't have that potential expense for the government. And because you have more stability, your, your tax revenue should be more stable as well. Um, and then the social impacts, you would, uh, in the current system, you have these housing bubbles, you have increased inequality, um, partly through the redistribution of uh, interest and all this debt, and partly through blowing up the houses of property, because the, you know, the wealthier you are, the more you can invest in property. Um, and also it weakens democracy, because really the, the power to shape the economy at the moment is with those who create money, and that is um, essentially the banking sector. Um, so yeah, if you switch to sovereign money, you would limit housing bubbles, you would slow the rise in inequality, and you would regain some democratic control over how the monetary system works.